Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. We have like great pleasure to uh, host Long Seng here. So I assume that most of you know Long Seng. For people that know, don't know Long Seng, so she did her PhD here, uh, finish one and a half years ago. Yeah. And uh, she was great friend to be with. So it's a uh, mm -hmm. great pleasure for me to introduce her. One of the member of the 464 group. <laughs> we all miss uh, you in this group. Uh, Longsen did her PhD on uh, uh, renewable energy in China, and that's her presentation now. She moved one and a half years ago. We still try to recover from that. She moved to England, and now she's a uh, University College of London, and she do great stuff for in Africa. But this presentation will focus on her PhD. Uh, we hope that we will convince her to come to visit us soon again. Uh, not only for seminars, but also for uh, seminar about Africa. So please yes. welcome Long Seng. Okay. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> Thanks for coming on a Friday afternoon, everybody. Um, so as you've mentioned, I'm now over um, at, the, at University College London um, in a department called Science, Technology, Engineering and Public Policy. So we have to shorten it to STEEP. Um, and there we're really uh, from quite diverse fields um, and we're looking at uh, how sci scientific and um, engineering knowledge can be uh, incorporated into the uh, policy process in creative ways. So we're doing research um, in this area. There's quite a strong group um, on climate change and also uh, uh, energy and development issues of which I'm a part. But um, and currently I'm doing research um, in Africa on agro industries and clean energy there. Uh, and I've also got a project going on um, renewable energy and um, community resilience uh, after the Nepal earthquake. But today we're going to go back a step and talk about uh, the PhD that I um, completed here. Um, so I was very happy to attend my uh, graduation ceremony a couple of weeks ago. So this is really nice. Uh, to come back and talk about my thesis. So am I okay in terms of volume and the uh, microphone? Yep. Okay. So today we're going to talk about capacity development um, and renewable energy in rural China. Um, by capacity development, I don't mean megawatts. I mean human capacity and institutional capacity to do things. Um, in my case, it is to look at how renewable energy can be used in rural areas, yeah? So it's about the skills and knowledge and the um, organizations the, um, and the institutions and policies that you need to support these kinds of um, initiatives. Um, so I did some case studies in Inner Mongolia in China, so I'll, I'll introduce those um, before we go into the analysis using um, a the framework that I developed for my thesis, the Renewable Energy um, Capacity Pyramid. Um, and then we'll look at the lessons learned both for China itself, um, renewable energy in rural areas, and also in the area of capacity development. So this is audience interaction time. What am I trying to say with these pictures? It's a really common saying. Very common saying, English saying. <laughs> Where are we? Who's yes? <laughs> Teach a man to fish, fish rather than giving a, giving him a fish. There's a second part to that. <laughs> <laughs> Give someone a fish to leave for a day. Teach someone a fish to leave for a lifetime. Yeah, that's right. So that's the second picture. Yeah, very good. Um, so giving a fish. This has been the kind of the traditional approach. Um, to aid, I have to say. Um, but there are some drawbacks to this kind of approach. Um, one of the, the main ones is that the community, since they haven't really been involved um, in, say, developing uh, the renewable energy system that they've been given, uh, they may not be able to operate and maintain it in the long term. Um, also, because they haven't been involved, the community can't uh, replicate that, even if it is successful, or the community next door to them aren't able to replicate it. Uh, and if they haven't been involved, then communities uh, tend, may not value what it is that they have been given. Maybe instead of a renewable energy system, they wanted 
a really nice shed to store their um, grain. So that can be also be a problem. Um, and worst of all, you can undermine uh, local jobs and markets. So for example, if you give a renewable energy system, uh, then maybe there was someone who sold kerosene um, from the local shop. And if you're giving away an energy source for free, then they have just lost their income. So it can actually have the opposite effect. So this approach can lead to um, entrenched dependency. So the latest development thinking on this is more along the lines of teaching to fish, um, teaching people and working with the community uh, along the process of developing technology. But this tends to be quite limited in terms of this, uh, quite focused on only skills and knowledge, teaching someone to do something. And I'm going to make an argument that this is capacity development is a, a wider issue. So I really like this quote, actually. So if you give me a fish, you have fed me for a day. If you teach me to fish, then you have fed me until the rev river is contaminated or the shoreline is seized for development. But if you teach me to organize, then whatever the challenge, I can join together with my peers and we will fashion our own solution. So this, for me, really defines capacity development. Instead of filling um, a very specific gap in skills and knowledge, you're working with people um, and taking them through a process which then they can replicate um, whatever the technology or issue that um, comes uh, is important to them. So being an academic, I need to really define my terms. And capacity development is as ill-defined as uh, sustainable development itself. But Last House has these four um, categories, which I found really helpful. Um, so one of the ways in which capacity is thought of um, is organizational. So that is a lot of the skills development within organizations that I talked about earlier. Um, and then it gets a bit uh, wider than that to look at uh, the institutional approaches, which is uh, the policies and the um, systems and the laws, whether written or unwritten, uh, that support uh, capacity. Uh, participatory approaches are quite focused on social justice um, and they work, very much work with the community on, um, on empowerment. And um, a systems approach kind of includes all of these um, all of these dimensions, and that's that's the kind of approach that I've taken um, to capacity development, and I'll, I'll go through that a bit later. So now we all know what capacity development is, not not to megawatt hours, but uh, how people do things. Um, so now we'll look at the case studies. Um, so all of them, I had three uh, case studies of renewable energy programs in China, uh, and, but I looked at Inner Mongolia autonomous region in particular. So Inner Mongolia, the autonomous region is um, just south of Inner Mongolia, the country, uh, and it's within uh, Chinese borders. Uh, it's, if you look at the human development index on that, it's actually doing quite well. Um, and also overall in China as well. The electrification rate in China overall is very high compared to um, other developing countries. So I saw this as a really good chance to explore how they managed to achieve this. Um, okay. So this is just some ima images to show you, um, show you the landscape, basically. So um, on your left is uh, is Huahaute, which is the main uh, main town, main city, um, the capital in Inner Mongolia. Uh, it's it's quite similar to other um, major cities in China. So very well developed, lots of services, um, educational institutions. Uh, but just a, an hour outside of that is the image on your right, which is much more rural and agricultural. So it's not far from rural areas and that's really where um, a lot of um, people in Inner Mongolia live. 
actually, let's go back a bit. Ah, I don't have it here, but um, the population in um, Inner Mongolia is mostly Han Chinese, but there is a large majority of um, Mongolians, like uh, ethnic descendants. So, and now I'm going to talk about the three projects briefly. So you see a little table um, outlining the aims and goals for each one. But I um, just wanted to draw your attention to the photos again. So on your left again is uh, inside a home of someone that has a renewable energy system in is sort of shown outside on your right. And you can see that it's actually quite, it has all the mod cons. This is not really your typical situation when you're talking about renewable energy in developing countries. So really large systems, uh, lots of services available and lots of energy being used, you know, DVDs, satellite TV, mobile phones, radio, everything. Um, so it's not really your uh, typical situation. So that's something to note. So the first program I looked at was um, the Brightness program, and that really focused on these kinds of household systems, um, usually with a small wind turbine and a few um, solar panels. It ran for a really long time and had these uh, huge, it had uh, the aim of providing uh, energy services uh, to households, you know, throughout the, the whole of uh, the Western region in China. So a really ambitious program. Um, and I think it worked really well in Inner Mongolia. Oh, it's just a bit of a close up. I wanted to put in this close up because you'll notice the power lines running over that system, the major. Um, <laughs> uh, so that Inner Mongolia is a major uh, mi uh, miner of coal, actually. And they sell that as electricity to ma major cities like um, Beijing is very close by. And these large, this is not a large transmission line, but you might, one might see large transmission lines bypassing communities on their way over to um, other major cities. So this is also uh, something that has come to the fore internationally um, about in debates about energy access in other countries as well, that having electricity being generated in a region does not mean that poor people actually have access to it. It might mean that the power lines go over their houses. <laughs> that, that, that's not really a very good definition of access. Um, so this is just another photo of uh, the system itself, uh, just to give you an idea. So those are the batteries um, on the bottom and on the top is your power electronics. So that cabinet is about my height. Uh, so how are these systems uh, distributed um, and maintained and installed? Um, so photo one is the uh, retail shop. And I was just really impressed uh, with the level of knowledge uh, of the farmers coming in, but also of the technicians there. Um, farmers would come in and say, I would like a 300 watt wind turbine, please. What do you have? Um, and that is an incredible amount of knowledge that they know how much electricity they're using, they know exactly the specifications that they're looking for and the kind of quality they're looking for and the kinds of manufacturers um, that are you know, selling in that area. So I was really impressed. Um, and uh, number two is some of the uh, installers and the farmers putting in a wind turbine um, for, uh, for a wedding. Uh, and uh, number three is one of, uh, one of the technicians um, repairing a, an inverter. And this is to highlight just how much technical ability these guys have. They are um, in a small town, probably within an hour's drive of the uh, farmers that they're servicing. But here he is in a very small town in a tiny shop that you see on the left. And he's replacing components on the circuit board which is something that I think I would struggle to do without a diagram. Uh, you know, I'd probably spend a day trying to figure out what's going on on this circuit board. So most people would e be expecting to replace the whole board and send it back to the manufacturer. But he's a, he knows that system well enough to diagnose it there on the spot. So really, really impressive stuff. Um, so the second program I looked at was the Township Electrification Program. These were much larger systems. 
Um, so you'll see on the left there the whole um, photovoltaic array. And then you might be able to see one of the wind turbines behind the house there. Um, so these are much larger systems, kind of in a mini-grid configuration, so in the kilowatt-hour scale. Uh, and they supply, um, in, Chi in China Township, uh, is one step bigger than a village. So, uh, and you'll see the battery bank there um, on the right. At the time of my visit, you can see that it's the batteries were um, needed replacing, basically. Um, and there was no provisions, further funding at the time uh, for replacing those batteries. And, you know, part, and this was also a really uh, ambitious program, so like a thousand um, sy township systems of this scale um, over a very short period of time. So perhaps they didn't have enough time in that program to look at the um, more long-term issues. And so part of, part of the problem Part of why, uh, why that particular system wasn't being repaired was it couldn't access the funding for repair was because uh, some of the um, designated townships actually changed locations. They actually got merged. So here you can see a, a school, it's a school building without a roof. So a lot of things were going out of repair because simply because all of the services and the seat of the government moved um, to to a neighbouring township. So since they'd kind of lost that designation, they couldn't then access the funding required. So people came up with these really creative ways around it. So they saw their neighbours with their individual household systems and they were able to buy second-hand panels. So this is, um, for those of you uh, in photovoltaics, you'll recognise that this kind of panel is fairly old with the um, round cells. So these kinds of second-hand systems were being sold and they did have the capacity to just wire something together in their backyard <laughs> with some really interesting orientations and shading going on there. Um, <laughs> but, you know, they roughly knew uh, how to get something working. So I thought that was also um, really high level of capacity of, you know, demonstration of skills and knowledge from the farmers themselves being creative. Um, REDP is the Renewable Energy Development Program. It was um, run by the World Bank, um, at mostly. Uh, also, over about a decade. Uh, and they showed quite a lot of flexibility. So they also worked all over um, Western China. But um, instead of defining the kinds of systems that they would be using, they decided to um, focus on the businesses um, and supporting them. So they did have subsidies for systems, but they didn't, def other than quality standards, they didn't define what those systems should look like. Um, so that meant that it tended to differ between, um, between uh, autonom you know, the autonomous regions and the other regions um, in Western China. So in Inner Mongolia, the systems looked a lot like the household systems I showed you earlier. Um, because the uh, brightness program had been running for a while. So this is just a um, timeline of the projects to help you visualize how they all kind of fit together. So at the time of the REDP, the brightness program had al already been running since 1996. So a lot of knowledge and capacity had already been built up using those kinds of smaller systems. And the township program um, was of a different scale using quite different technology, as you can see, um, sort of in the middle of that program. But really, uh, the brightness program is really the, uh, the major push of the Inner Mongolian and the um, Chinese government at the time. OK, so now we've been to Inner Mongolia. We know what uh, capacity development is. Um, we'll now take a deeper look at those case studies. So this is the um, analytical framework that um, I came up with during uh, my PhD. Um, and so I guess the traditional focus for uh, renewable energy programs and also capacity development in general has been 
very focused on the tools and the hardware and perhaps the financing as well, um, how, you know, how to physically uh, get the systems there. Um, and capacity development focusing on skills and knowledge of individuals um, in rural areas. Um, but I also wanted to in look at organisational structures. So having skilled individuals in remote areas isn't really helpful unless they have jobs so that they, that capacity can be sustained um, you know, far away from the city. So that is really to do with um, organisational structures and um, the financial viability of those, um, of those businesses. Uh, those businesses don't exist in isolation, so the supply chain is also really important. So, part of part of why um, part, part of why the technicians in Inner Mongolia were so impressive um, was because when I asked them, they, I said, "Oh well, how did you manage to learn how to do this?" Um, and they said, "Well, it's obvious. I um, I went to the manufacturers uh, for about a week. I did a course. Uh, I read the manual." And uh, if I have any problems, I just call them up for a chat, really. Um, <laughs> so those businesses in rural areas were able to access the expertise of the um, manufacturers, which were also in Inner Mongolia. So that really plays into it. So what other kinds of businesses or organisations along the supply chain are really needed to support all of these things above it, yeah? And I think also most importantly, the institutional environment. So, you know, China was able to put in place such long-term projects like the Brightness Program that ran over um, decades and also have uh, other projects that would kind of feed into it or use similar technology and have such a long-term plan. Um, I think that is really important. So the institutional environment, I would say, really forms the bulk of what is needed. So I think this is at the top simply because it's smallest. <laughs> and actually all the work is really down here. Yeah, and it's, it really supports the use of uh, renewable energy in um, very rural and remote situations. So uh, I took this framework and analyzed all of the, uh, all of the programs. Um, so this is the uh, hardware part of it and also how it is funded. So um, the Brightness Program and the um, REDP focused on hybrid wind and photovoltaic uh, systems and both of them provided subsidies for those. Um, and it's interesting, those of you who have worked um, on markets will know that uh, these subsidies kind of need to be in line so as not to kind of um, cancel each other out or if you're providing uh, too much subsidies then it's very difficult to kind of take it away. Um, the Township Electrification Program was quite different um, in that it focused on much larger systems, sort of mini grid configurations from a central location supplying to households um, in quite a not an urban area, but um, sort of more densely populated area. But they were also wind and photovoltaic <coughs> systems, much larger scale, and they used technology that um, was initially from Germany. Uh, and they provided grant funding for it, so quite different from the other two. And as I mentioned before, uh, they had some issues then with uh, maintenance and operation costs. Uh, because it was just initial grant funding. And then it was later on that they put in place um, further funding for operation and maintenance, but not everyone was able to access it. Uh, then we move on to the skills and knowledge required of you know, people in remote areas. I think it's skills and knowledge of every group, you know, not, just, not just technicians, because the end users also do uh, a lot of a lot of the uh, work, I think, um, in maintaining those systems and diagnosing any problems. So in the Brightness Program and the RED and the Renewable Energy Development Program, focusing on those household systems, uh, 
both end users and technicians had really excellent levels of skill. In the Township Electrification Program, end users had a different relationship with their renewable energy system. It was much more like how we would relate to our grid. I don't really know where my nearest substation is and I wouldn't know how to fix it. Um, <laughs> if anything went wrong, I would just call the power company and they would come along with their engineers their excellent skills and fix it for me. So end users and local technicians tended to have you know, poorer skills and knowledge about their own energy system um, in that case. But we did see that when this those kinds of systems failed um, in Inner Mongolia, the end users and technicians did know enough about these kind of smaller household systems. So this technology um, it did translate and transfer over um, to other people. Um, so that was really interesting. Um, but they did have really excellent engineers because they did, um, they do have some really good uh, technical universities focusing on agricultural machinery and engineering in Inner Mongolia itself. So they had um, technicians within, uh, just in the main uh, city and they could be called out, but only in summer. Um, so organizational structures to support all of this. So what was really interesting about the um, Brightness program and the RADP is that they really use the same uh, base of technicians and organizations to achieve uh, what they did. So the Brightness companies were established through grants, but before that, the same people and the same organizations had worked um, on renewable energy extension stations and before that, those people worked in um, agricultural extension um, in the same region. So actually you saw the evolution of organizations as China uh, moved from more socialist uh, and planned approach to infrastructure to, um, to more market-based mechanisms. And that, you know, that evolution took time and these organizations kind of changed formats and, uh, and financial structures several times um, in order to do that. And the latest iteration is actually the establishment of these brightness companies that are either um, state-owned enterprises or 50% owned by the state and 50% owned by the, um, I guess, by uh, the local, uh, local head, I suppose, and then he would employ the technicians, but really, they really knew their stuff because they didn't just start going into renewable energy for the brightness program. They were, uh, they had built up their skills and knowledge and networks way before that. Um, the township program, they didn't really have that same basis because the technology was so different and it's organized quite differently because it's a mini grid. Um, they didn't really have that kind of ongoing uh, sort of ongoing uh, evolution of uh, of institutions and organizations um, so they really did start um, <coughs> during the township program and they had operators um, in the township and also engineers located in the capital um, so as I said these organizations don't exist in isolation um, there needs to be enough of a momentum. Um, and I don't think these organizations have to be local, but so they might be organizations that exist um, regionally. It just so happens that Inner Mongolia itself does, did do a lot of um, the early um, manufacturing and technology development for photovoltaics and wind technology. So they had really, really good access to that there. Um, and so the majority of the supply chain for these smaller systems and larger systems were really located in China. Uh, sorry, these smaller systems were quite local in Inner Mongolia, but there was also capacity for larger systems across China. Um, yeah. Mm, so I think this is really the key. Uh, is the in supportive institutional environment allowed 
the capacity should be built up over time through iterations and iterations. So <coughs> all of them had really good policy support from the highest level um, of the Chinese government, um, as well as Inner Mongolia itself put in quite a lot of money. Um, this was a strategic choice because a lot of um, a lot of electrification in China was achieved through microhydro, um, and Inner Mongolia looked at its own energy renewable energy resources and said, "Well, we don't really have very much hydro, <laughs> uh, so we're going to have to do something else, and that something else uh, is going to be wind." And then later on, they added photovoltaics. And this is the main way we're going to do rural electrification. So very early on, um, they were doing their pilot projects not as marginal experiments, but as serious um, contenders for electrification in just in that area. Um, and this was to, and this was, it's also true of microhydro in China. So that's why they have um, such a fantastic. Uh, rural electrification figure. Um, there was also uh, some linkages between the programs and with development in general because they were done through um, the National Development and Reform Commission and previous iterations of that organisation. So it fit in quite well with um, development uh, thinking for the Western region in China. So that was really important. Um, and also, not to, not to be sneezed at, is of course the really favourable um, macroeconomic environment in China at the time. So it went through, you know, had uh, really excellent growth figures. Um, and, it, you know, basically there were cross subsidies being um, between uh, the eastern region of China and then the western region through, um, through the political deal that was made in the beginning f to actually establish these special trade and economic zones in the east, that the western regions wouldn't be left behind through these um, special concessions. So, you know, so they made good on that and so there was quite a lot of um, investment back into infrastructure in the western region but also because they needed, um, they needed a lot of the resources um, for, to fuel that growth and, the, um, and also the labour force as well. Okay, so I've taken you briefly using the framework through all three case studies. Um, and so what is the wider implications for this? So just um, in terms of my thesis, I, I drew out the things that were um, most pertinent in each one of these categories um, to make a successful renewable energy program. So in terms of, school, in terms of tools, um, if you want reliable hardware, um, then you will actually need more than technical reliability. You'll need all these things at the bottom. So uh, in terms of skills and knowledge, as I mentioned before, the end users and everyone up the supply chain needs to have um, the appropriate technical skills and knowledge, but also uh, commercial skills um, of those organisations as well. In terms of organisational structures to support that, um, they need to have sustainable financial arrangements, um, need to be effective organisations uh, in terms of being able to take action, having the right people on board, um, having the right physical resources um, such as a vehicle to actually get to um, the remote areas, um, having access to spare parts and so forth. Um, and we also saw in Inner Mongolia that those organisations evolved over time. They changed financial structures um, and they changed, um, changed organisational structures over a few decades. So flexibility just to stay alive. Um, through changing times is really important. Um, otherwise, that those skills and knowledge would surely have been lost by now if those people found jobs in other <coughs> sectors. So, brings me to um, sectorial networks. Um, so I mentioned before that organised you need 
organizations along the whole supply chain, not necessarily in the local area, but accessible, um, so that when parts break down, uh, you can call someone to fix them, um, depending on uh, how, just how complex the problem is. Um, also, there are other benefits to having um, a sort of a local manufacturing or systems hub. Um, there's more learning across the different kinds of organisations, as we saw in Inner Mongolia. Just being able to pick up the phone is really important. Um, and also being able to know what's been happening um, in farmers' lives and what kinds of um, energy technologies they're interested in now or need now. That's really important. So the information can flow both ways. Um, and then also forming advo advocacy coalitions as well and being effective in that, uh, sort of building a certain momentum in the industry. Uh, and then we come to the uh, institutional environment. So I think long-term policy frameworks are really important. Integrated planning um, with other development, um, development plans is really important. Um, needs to align with the values of, and norms of the situation, of the context. Um, otherwise, otherwise, it may end up being out on its own. So we saw with the um, township ele electrification program, Inner Mongolia for decades had been exploring the use of household level systems and they had built up a lot of expertise um, well, they had a lot of systems installed, they had the expertise, they had organisations along that pipeline, and they also had quite a few of the organisations in the sector, all focused on household level systems. Um, and the township electrification program didn't really make use of that. Um, and so when the funding dropped out, people weren't really able to cope with that very well until uh, new lines of funding were made available. Um, and also favourable macroeconomic environment. You really just can't get away from that. Um, if you're looking at this period um, in China, of that being a major factor um, in the success of the program. So in conclusion, I think Continuity, so like a more programs-based approach rather than individual projects is important. So that there's learning between um, projects. Um, we saw in Inner Mongolia quite an incremental approach um, and the evolution of organisations throughout time. That is also really important, a step-by-step -step kind of approach. Um, that capacity can be at the local, provincial or national levels and that it's really required at all of those levels. Um, and the ability to retain capacity um, is really important. So this kind of resilience that I was talking about, this ability to be flexible, um, to change with the times, that is really important part of the success story. So take home message from this. If you're working not in Inner Mongolia, what should you take away? Um, well, that it's really better to um, assess what is there in terms of institutions, sector, organisations, skills and knowledge, and what has been used in the past. Um, and to build on that is very important. And that context really does matter. So, yeah, thank you very much. Have a round.